Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I am your humble host with a little bit more of a rasp in his voice, Coach Jason Coop. I just got back from a run this morning and the air quality index was on the borderline of what I would normally go run at, about 100 or 120 here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And the consequence for that is my voice is just really hoarse and it comes through during this intro and also during the podcast itself. But the show must go on. On the podcast today, I have none other than Rick Prince, who is the CEO and the founder of USCA, which stands for the United Endurance Sports Coaching Academy. Rick and I got to know each other as we developed a coaching certification for ultra marathon coaches, something that I never in my wildest dreams ever would have thought would actually be a thing, a certification specifically for ultra marathon coaches. But USCA also offers coaching certifications for triathlon coaches and running coaches and will soon be offering one for cycling coaches as well. Rick and I have a business to business relationship. He approached me about creating this, certificate, this coaching certification. I wrote most of the content for it. So in an effort of full disclosure, any of the sales emanating from that, certif- that coaching certification, I do receive a royalty from. But I wanted to bring Rick on the podcast today to help shed some light on how athletes can navigate finding the right coach. I've had a few podcasts on this particular subject, and this podcast is right in that same vein. So if you're an athlete that is looking for a coach, listen up, you'll get some pointers on how to find the right coach for you. In addition to that, we go over why coaching education is so important for the landscape, the landscape of coaches, and also for the end users, which are the athletes. It is something that I am very passionate about. As we know, coaching is an unregulated industry. You can hang a shingle up on the side of your house and you can call yourself a coach. And because of that, There are very good coaches out there that do a great job with their athletes, but there are also some really bad coaches out there. And those bad coaches have create bad experiences for their athletes. And also it's also bad for the industry as a whole, which we talk about in the podcast as well. I've always appreciated Rick's entrepreneurial spirit. There's always things coming down the line from him and what he's dreaming up of and how to make coaches and athletes better. And that definitely shines throughout the course of this podcast. I hope everybody out there appreciates appreciates it. That's what I wanted to say. And without any further ado, we're gonna get right into it. Here's my conversation with Rick Prince from USCA. Okay, I figured the I figured out the perfect way to introduce this, Rick. Hold on one second. I gotta grab something from my bookshelf. Okay. You'll, you'll get a kick out of this. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, hold on, I gotta put my cans back on really quick. <laughs> yes, yes, this is gonna be a failure of audio. So for the people that are that are listening to the podcast version and not watching the YouTube version, I have this USA Track and Field National Coaching Education Program binder. How old do you think this is, Rick? Take a guess. Ooh, ooh, uh, 20 years old? Yeah, you're pretty close. Oh. You're pretty. I think it's actually older than that because I I took this when I was 18 years old. Wow! And I still have the notes from inside. <laughs> I love it. I love yeah. it. It's all track and field stuff though. It's like how to set set up relay, how to do this, how to do that, and the other. And um, the the reason I wanted to kind of set it up like this is is I've been coaching for a really long time, and when I first got into coaching and I, and I wanted to like explore it professionally, there were very few avenues out there to actually do it. There were very, there were very few educational opportunities and those educational opportunities were limited to this USA track and field certification. That's probably 23 or 24 years old. Um, any other certifications with the national governing bodies like USA triathlon or USA cycling, and maybe a small handful of conferences like you just couldn't figure out like how to be kind of how to how to be a coach essentially and so i became a, a almost like a collector of sorts of all of these different certifications i mean you name it i went to it cscs nsca 
ACSM, USA Track and Field, USA Cycling, USA Triathlon. At one point or another, I had I, I had them all. I might have had them all concurrently actually at one point in my career. And, yeah, exactly, exactly. And at, at a certain at a certain point, they kind of like the novelty of them kind of wore off because a combination of the my personal trajectory in coaching. And then also the, just the way that they were set up, I guess, is more, is, is, is a, is a better way to put it. And that's with all due respect to the NGBs and the, in, in these, in these other organizations that are out there, they do a fine job, but it does, it, it does kind of become limiting. And, and I would say particularly so on the national governing body side, cause they're trying to serve a lot of masters, right? They're trying to serve the athletes. They're trying to serve the coaches. They're part of the Olympic movement. And when they're trying to also educate coaches, it's just, it just becomes really kind of really jumbled. And so when you and I started working together professionally, that was the background, right? Of this, of this huge, like this long background of me kind of falling in love with collecting all these certifications and then falling out of love with the collecting all these certifications. And the reason I bring that, that, that up is that says a lot about my involvement with USCA because it, I'm, I'm the first one to admit not only for myself, but also for the coaches that I have the privilege of working with, we're pretty choosy on like who we, how we actually go about educating them, whether it's through a national governing body or whether it's through this certification, that certification, whatever it could, because we realize it's so kind of, it's so limiting. And so that's my background with, with certifications. And I know you kind of came into it very similarly when, when, when we've had talks about it, how, like, tell us how USCA initially started, like what prompted you to say, you know what, this is what, this is what I'm going to do for a living. This is how I'm going to, this is, this is my next move in my professional career. Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, my primary background is, was, was in the fitness industry. I was a personal trainer. Then I kind of worked my way up into fitness management. Um, I was working in New York City pretty much my entire professional career. And, you know, gyms, at least in New York, are largely, you know, as far as the trainers, they're mostly bodybuilders, you know, they're like, you know, big jack guys. So I was the low, usually the lone skinny guy in during, <laughs> you know, did bike racing and running and all that kind of stuff. So as a result, I always got the, you know, all the questions and all the, the people that came into the gym that wanted to do a 5K, a triathlon, a, you know, a century on their bike. I was always the, the point person. And you know, the questions I would get and the amount of questions I would get was just staggering. Um, and I realized that, you know, there really wasn't, um, to your point, you know, a lot of great resources out there. Um, and, you know, and, and also similar to the coaching industry, the fitness industry is completely unregulated. You know, there's no, it's very certification driven, but unlike, you know, lawyer, doctor, electrician, you know, there's no license uh, or, you know, a thing that everyone has to take. So, uh, you know, the broad spectrum as far as what you get from, from personal trainers when they're talking to either, you know, just regular fitness clientele or endurance athletes is all over the place. So that was sort of the catalyst. My thought was, well, wait, you know, if all these people are coming to me with these questions, um, you know, there's, there's got to be something out there for this. And I, and I think I could serve that niche. And I did look into the NGBs. Um, I was a USA cycling coach and, and it was fine. But again, I kind of felt like I could do better and I wanted to, uh, to raise the standard of the ed education out there of coaches and, and so on and so forth. So that was really it, you know, again, because like personal training, you know, you have amazing trainers and you have some not so amazing trainers. Um, and so again, I just kind of want to raise the benchmark for, for coaching as a whole based off my experience as a coach, as well as in the fitness industry. What do you think it's going to take to consolidate it all? Because I have the same, I mean, I kind of have the same gripe that you do in, in the coaching world, right? That you just mentioned that there's no, anybody can hang a shingle, yeah. right? Anybody can go out and hang a shingle and say, I'm a coach. And the, what that does is that creates a huge range of professionalism, of education levels, of even service levels and things like that. And not that everything has to be like totally cookie cutter, but I do think that some level of not standardization, but some, but some level, some bar to jump over some, you know, very low rudimentary type of bar to jump over is good for the entire industry. Because what happens is, is people don't know how to navigate. They say they want to coach. And I see this all the time. They say they want to coach. 
they don't know how to navigate the whole process. And what ends up happening as a byproduct of that is just chance, right? It's just by luck if they end up having a great coach and a great experience. And that is good for the coaching industry, which is what I'm in, right? Sure. They tell their friends, hey, I had this coach who was good for me, blah, blah, blah. But there's also a chance that they have somebody who's underqualified, somebody who's not doing it for the right reason, somebody who doesn't have their business set up correctly, somebody who's not, who's undereducated and on and on and on. And that athlete has a poor experience and spreads that word as well. And usually with a 10 X type of megaphone, right? Cause we know that about customer service is people are more likely to, to share poor experience versus a, versus a good one. And that's bad for the coaching industry. And that's what infuriates me when I see that. And why, when I hear athletes have that type of experience. And so once again, there are all these different types of types of players, right? That are, that are trying to raise the bar and us is one of them. NGBs are one of them. There are other kind of private entities, even training peaks, right? Which is predominantly a coaching platform. They have an arm, which is trying to educate, uh, educate coaches. Like, what is it going to take? Or is it, is it even possible to, to, to have that kind of like lower bar so that everybody has a better experience? Yeah, that's a great question too. And, and you know, and it's always fascinating to me because what we do as coaches, as personal trainers, you know, you're you're affecting people's body. You're messing with people's body. <laughs> you're the God. If you tell them to go out and run 500 miles, they're going to go out and run 500 miles. Yeah. If you tell them to do yeah. 9,000, you know, 800 repeats, they're going to do it. Um, you know, I had a physical therapist friend of mine who said, you know, personal trainers were God's gift to physical therapists because so many of them ended up over there. <laughs> it, so the fact that you know. Other other medical profession or medical professionals, I should say, you know, that also mess with the body, you know, have to be certified. I find it profoundly shocking that there is not a, a license or something that personal trainers, coaches have to get. Um, it would probably put me out of business, but honestly, I'd be fine with that. I feel like there needs to be some type of standardization. You know, again, in the, I hate to keep referring back to it, but in the fitness world, I believe there are a few certifications that have kind of come together, almost like a conglomerate. You know, they're still separate entities, but they kind of work together to say, hey, you know, we're in this together. We have the same voice. We're in it for the same reason. Um, there's a discussion of being accredited. Um, you know, NCCA is one of the big ones. Um, I, we've been looking at that closely. You know, we haven't found one that really kind of suits what we're going for. There's a lot of different uh, bodies out there. But I, I guess to answer your question, I, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible, um, but, but it definitely is a problem. And I will also say, I think one of the things, and I'm sure, Jason, you see this as well, is um, also just educating the consumer on what to look for. You know, I think one of the biggest things is, you know, well, okay, Jason, you ran a four minute marathon, therefore you must be a great coach or you've done Western States, you've done this many. And, uh, you know, so I think so much of what people look for in coaches is how good of an athlete they were or how many races, you know, how many big races they've done. And they might be a great coach, but they also might not, you know, and I always kind of associate that to that great, you know, to a professor you might've had in college who was just lights out brilliant, you know, he might be able to program a rocket to go to Mars, but he couldn't, you know, teach his way out of a paper bag. So there's not necessarily a correlation. So I think educating the consumer also on what to look for in a coach and how to ask the right questions, I think is equally important. And what, what is that? Cause that's the million dollar question that, you know, that I think athlete, that we can arm athletes with. And yep. I, I've had a few podcasts on this same theme. I'll, I'll link them up in the, in the show notes for people that are interested. But from your perspective, Rick, because you, you've got a unique perspective on this, which I truly appreciate. You see coaches from a variety of different backgrounds all come up through your education platform. And then there's follow on, right? You've got this really great Facebook group where people are, are I would say they're very interactive with each other. You have people from USCA that kind of help mentor, you know, these coaches uh, kind of along the journey. But if you had an athlete come to you, and, and besides being USCA certified, if you had an athlete come to you and say, hey, what do I look for? Like, what do I look for in a coach? We've already kind of said like what not to look for, like being an elite athlete doesn't automatically qualify you as a good coach. And that, that's a great example that, that gets used a lot. But what should athletes actually be looking for? I think there's a lot of things. I think first and foremost, I, I would look for them to to be up to date with the most recent, you know, research, the most recent information, and be really curious. Because I think, you know, yes, we certify coaches, but 
you know, at the end of the day, once you become certified, it's kind of on you to, to stay up, up to date on everything and things change. I think that alone speaks volumes because if they, if the coach isn't up to date or if they're, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, I was certified X, Y years ago and they just kind of hang their hat on their, their own race results and what they do personally versus, you know, what, what the data says. I think that's a big red flag. I think it, and it also just shows professionalism. So I would say that's, yeah probably one of the biggest things. And, and I think that's just, uh, it just shows how seriously they take it um, as far as being a professional, whether or not it's their side gig. You know, I always say, look, you know, when you're at your day job, you know, you should be hundred percent at your day job. But once you flip that switch and you're working with athletes, you have to be hundred percent for that athlete and, and stay up to date on everything. Um, so I would say that's, that's probably one of the biggest things is just you know, being curious, you know, keeping up with, with whatever is, is keeping your ear to, to the industry that you're in, whether it be cycling, running, triathlon, so on and so forth. Here, here's the thing with that is when I ask coaches that, the really good ones, if they, the really good ones explain a framework to me. Like if I ask them, okay, how do you, how do you get you, you yourself as a coach better? Yep. If they can describe the framework it doesn't have to be the same. Every yeah. Tuesday I go and I look up these journals or every, you know, X, Y, Z, I network with these professionals. If there's some architecture or some framework to that, I'm staying up on the latest research, I'm developing myself as, as a professional. It's, there's almost like a chasm between the coaches that can describe that process of, of, of continuing to get themselves better versus the coaches that like bumble through that, that answer yeah. that don't really know say, oh, well, you know, I coach a lot or, you know, they just, they just don't have a framework. Right. So their answer yeah. is really, is really fumbly. Yeah. I think that I personally, like I've always found that is the telltale sign between the coaches that take it professionally, that yeah. it's their, it's not their side gig, right. It's their profession. It's what they do for a living. It's, they treat it very seriously versus the ones that are like, man, I could, I could probably make an extra 500 bucks a month doing this, like, just because I can bring in, you know, 10 clients or whatever it is that I, I've always found that that's the biggest difference is they can, they can describe that framework to which you were just talking to. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would also add that, you know, that's on sort of the, the, the knowledge side from the business side. Um, being an effective communicator is so critical. Um, you know, my wife was worked as a running coach when we lived in New York City, and she got so many calls from people who said, hey, I reached out to, you know, these people, these people, and I just don't hear back, or, you know, I'll email them a question, and I never hear back. And so, you know, also, once you're in that coaching relationship, you know, you can also tell, even if this person is, you know, lights out smart and stays up on the most recent research, if they don't return phone calls, or you're, you know, they take way too many clients, and you're just, you know, instead of being you know, Jason Coop, you're, you know, client number 5,948 <laughs> and, and they just don't really care. Again, that's a problem. So I think there's also that component as well. Yeah. Our athlete services manager, Dominic, who I think you've, you've met before, he will, he'll always say that we have, anytime there's a problem, it's a communication problem. It's mm, never yes. an efficacy problem or a prescription problem or anything like that. It's always a communication problem. Yeah. Um, so that, that speaks to that, that, that really well. So that's really poignant because that's a piece within all of the different USCA certifications. Let's kind of like take a step back, right? And not to, not, we're not going to plug USCA too much, or I'm not going to let you plug it too much, yeah. even though we're both involved in it. But you've set up each of the, I would say the disciplines, am I describing that correctly? Like each of the certification disciplines with kind of the same structure where they've got the same kind of things that each of the certifications touch. Why don't you like run the audience through what those are and then why you chose to like lay it out like that? Because I think that's something really unique as opposed to the NGB certifications that are just more like, it's almost like more tactical heavy, like here's how you do these things. Right, right. Um, yeah, so we kind of approached it like you would uh, a four year degree in college, honestly, you know, um, you know, Coop, you, you have this as well, obviously, you know, before you can learn about, you know, anything applied, uh, you have to learn the fundamentals, you know, my first year in college, I took anatomy and physiology one, anatomy and physiology two, biology, chemistry, physics, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And then from there, you get into you know, the biomechanics of running and, and all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of how we set it up with the the thought process was you can't apply something that you don't know. So we wanted to teach what the body is, how the body works. And once you have that foundation of, of knowledge, not to say you're, you're going to go out there and be performing brain surgery, but you have a pretty good idea of how, how everything works as it 
pertains to being a coach, uh, then you can take that information and apply it. And then you have a better understanding of, of what to do when you're working with athletes. So, you know, skeletal system, muscular system, energy systems, um, you know, how the body moves and mechanics of it, lever systems. And from there, then you get into the sport specific stuff, how to do programming, um, nutrition, you know, mental training comes into play. Um, but it all kind of falls back to your point on those first few foundation modules um, on, on what the body is. And, you know, we don't have a tiered based system. Uh, you know, meaning we don't have a level one certification, level two, level three. Um, I've always found that kind of odd because you never know what's going to come walking through your door as far as who wants to work with you. So our thought process is just make a really robust, comprehensive certification um, that includes all of this information. While it might seem overwhelming, um, hopefully, you know, again, doing it structured that way, it enables people to learn what we feel is the proper way to learn. And what I, the thing that I've appreciated the most about that after get, after diving into the content is that foundational approach, because it's, especially in today's social media world, it's really easy to get the prescription or the answer, right? It's really easy to copy paste name, whoever's coaching philosophy. I mean, even I've written a book and I've seen people copy paste my you know, philosophy into you, if they're self coach, or I've even seen other coaches just kind of do it. But it's really easy for coaches just to look at other coaches and copy paste what they're doing, and have no idea what the underlying physiology, what the underlying biomechanics, or even like you start with the skeletal system, right? That's like unit two, unit two, am I remember that correctly? Yeah. yeah, all right, I remember that correctly. Yeah, so or module two, sorry. Um, but that fundamentals first approach like lays the whole foundation and then everything kind of builds on top of that. But another thing that you've like baked into the, into this entire certification is like more of the business side of it, right? Like explain to the listeners, like why you chose to do that, because that's a sticky thing to get into, right? A lot of times as coaches, we're worried about, oh, is this 10 minute interval, right? Or is it, do I want a 12 minute interval, right? We get really like nuanced on this like right. prescription piece, but you took a step back and said, okay, we need like coaches need to be, if somebody wants to be a coach, you need to be educated on how to set their business up. Like, why did you choose to do that specifically? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I got a lot of feedback. I should say, you know, when I was developing, I got a lot of feedback from, from people and knowing the audience I was going to be serving that hopefully these people would take this. And, and while some people do it for their own knowledge, most people are going to be wanting to go out there and hang out there and shingle. Um, you know, it's kind of like you hear that all the time with lawyers and doctors, you know, they, they go through all the school and become a lawyer and a doctor. And then they're out there and they're like, oh my God, I have no idea how to set up my business from, from the business side. Yeah, so, yeah. so while it wasn't necessarily the, the main focus clearly of our certification, um, I did feel it was important uh, to have that aspect of it because without that, you know, it's like, well, great. I, I'm armed with all this information. I have absolutely no, nothing to do with it now. I have no idea what to do. Um, and, and while we certainly could have gone a lot deeper, I mean, you know, you could probably have another certification just on how to start a business. Um, it hopefully lays a, a groundwork for, you know, for these coaches to be able to understand, you know, some of the legal aspects of setting up a business, some of the things to look out for, how to market, so on and so forth. So again, it wasn't a massive part of it, but I did feel it was important to, to just bring to light. Where do you think if you're like criticizing or like analyzing the current suite of stuff right now, where do you think the gaps are? Um, probably in the continuing education field, I think is probably one of the biggest, biggest gaps. You know, what we what we were just sort of talking about, you know, you, you get certified, um, you've learned a lot of stuff, but you know, things change on a minute to minute basis. And, and then what do you do? You know, and unfortunately within our industry, a lot of the sort of continuing education in my opinion, is very much of a money grab. You know, it's, okay, we've got your initial money, but how can we make more? So get these specializations, um, which, which oftentimes are just geared towards making more money. Um, so again, it kind of comes back to being a student of the sport. It means to, to your, what you were talking about, talking to the smartest people, reading books, really looking to see, again, what's new out there. But so much of it, the onus falls back on the coach. It's not going to present itself out there to them. Um, you know, you can certainly take other courses, nutrition, that take other certifications, sort of the formal approach, but the informal approach, I would say, is just, again, being a student of the sport and really, uh, really doing due diligence on your own and, you know, going on to PubMed and some of these peer-reviewed journal sites and just, you know, Googling stuff, see what comes up, but, but not going on blogs, unless it's a well-respected blog, not, you know, just... <laughs> 
just, you know, Googling stuff and just going with the first thing that pops up. Because unfortunately, that's what we see and you see, I'm sure, all the time. And trying to get the real source of the information. I think that's that's one of the biggest gaps is once people get a certification or they've got a few clients under the belt, like, great, I'm done. I'm the world's best coach. You know, my, my client PR for Boston. That's it. I'm, I know what I'm doing. And, and unfortunately, that's just not the case. Well, it, it because of and COVID actually highlighted this a lot. It becomes a very insulated profession, right? Where you can just hang a shingle and you can just have your athletes and you can have a, maybe your small circle is just you, right? Yeah. Or maybe it's you and your spouse that like, you know, bounce ideas off of each other or something like that. Like that professional network, if you don't, if you don't deliberately take the time to develop a professional network to get mentorship, to answer questions for the answers that you have, it, it becomes one of those things where, okay, how am I going to solve this problem? Okay, I'm going to Google it and it's going to be the first thing on the, on the results or I'm going to find a podcast or something like that and you don't know where those people are coming from. So that professional development I've always found is like, that that to me is where the biggest gap is, right? Yeah. It's It's the continuing education is like one piece of the professional development piece, yeah. right? And the professional development piece has mentorship, continuing education, and on and on and on and on. Yeah. Um, we we kind of, we touched on this a little bit earlier, right? And sometimes I I get I get a little bit insulated because I am a coach and I've been a coach for so long. But why does this matter to athletes, right? Like, why ultimately does high quality coaching, high quality coaches? It's really easily self-serving to me to say, yeah, it matters because I'm in the industry and I want the industry to be professional and robust and people have a good experience because that's forward feeding. And I like good competition, right? I like having other good coaches in there because sure. I can go out and I can network with them and they provide a good experience to athletes. But just like good coaching is good for coaching, bad coaching is bad for coaching yes. as a business, as a profession and things like that. But like, why, like, why does it matter to the athlete side of it? Because you could take the approach of just because if you're getting information from somebody that knows just a little bit more than you, you're still going to be a little bit better. Right. <laughs> but why does ha why does having like a robust and well-educated coach at the end of the day, why does that ultimately matter? Yeah, it matters, I think. And you're right. I mean, if, if someone knows a little bit more than you, then you're more like more than likely going to see results up to a certain point. You're going to be, you know, be able to be coached and, and see results up until the threshold of what that person knows. Um, in my opinion, the goal is, uh, you know, not that you expect every athlete that you have to be going to the Olympics or, you know, qualify for Western states or anything like that. But you need to be that coach that has that level of knowledge that can do that. You know, and while I understand that some people want to work, focus on beginners, some people more on elite, so on and so forth, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't come well equipped with, you know, with this broad base of knowledge. So I feel like it, it does a disservice to your point to the coaching industry, but also to the athletes that you serve if you don't, you know, really have a broad base of knowledge to be able to keep growing with that athlete, you know. Um, and I would say that from a professional level, scope of practice, if you only know X amount, then you need to be able to say, look, I, here's what I know. Um, I can take you up to this point, but after that, you know, you got to go probably somewhere else or work with someone else. I doubt that very often happens, um, you know, but, but that would be the professional thing to do. And that's why it's important to have all this, uh, you know, information and, and keep pushing the boundaries as far as what, the, you know, you know, individually as a coach. So you've got these four, right? four different certifications, running, cycling, triathlon, and ultra running. Yeah, cycling is in development now, but yeah. Cycling is in <laughs> development. I'm kind of teasing. This is going to come out before it's like fully launched, but you can expect it soon, right? I'm putting you on the hook for this right now. I knew it's in development. I can't remember when it was going to be released. Right. But you get this for it started with running, right? And then to triathlon. Yep, actually started with triathlon, characters? went to running, went to ultra running, and almost cycling. <laughs> okay, so thanks for correcting me on the on the, on the the order there. Um, why is ultra running different than? Yeah. So ultra running, you know, I bought your book, um, and I started reading it and I'm like, oh my God, cause I'll be hundred percent honest with you. I I've, I've never done an ultra running race. You just jack up the numbers a little bit and, and there you go. Um, and I, I was reading your book and I'm like, 
oh my God, this is, this is insane. Um, and, and I realized that there were just so many things that are completely, completely different about ultra running. And I only, that only, you know, I only, you know, sort of got that, um, you know, understood that more after talking to you, but, but yeah, I realized that it's, it's not just all marathon. Clearly there's a, there's a heck of a lot more to it. But so I, this is a good plug for the book. I appreciate that. I didn't ask you to do that. Um, <laughs> and I agree with you that ultra running is a different sport, but it'd be really easy just to bolt it on to running. Sure. You know, like it'd be sure. super easy just because you already had the running one built. Yeah. Right. And you could have just said, okay, here's the, you know, ultra, here's how you adapt it to the ultra yeah. running like yeah. module or, or whatever. But instead, like there are certain pieces of the running that are like common to the ultra running piece, yeah. but then there are certain pieces that are not. And, let, and let's back up a little bit. We need, might need to pull up the, the website. Let's run through all the modules for the ultra running side of it and okay. which ones have like common elements and which ones are kind of completely new in the, in the ultra running side. And, and where I'm going with this is it's not just copy paste stuff, right? right. I mean, they really are like I, I, I as a coach, I've coached cyclists, athletes, runners, ultra runners, you kind of name it. I would take all of these individually. And yeah, I would breeze through three or four of the units on each one, but they're kind of like standalone. They're not just bolt on things. So let's start with the ultra running piece and just like run through the modules and then okay. just go, this one's common with running. This one's not just to see like what the unique elements of it are. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't, well, I don't have it up in front of me right now. What I can tell you right now, you know, especially after having lots of conversations and working with you, you know, certainly those foundation modules are, are very much the same, you know, how, how the body works, but you know, the nutritional element training the gut, you know, what's different for running hundred miles, 200 miles versus, you know, five K, 10 K marathon. Um, the programming I think is one of the biggest differences, quite frankly, um, you know, at least as far as how, how we teach it from the running versus ultra running. Um, I think that has a profound difference. The, the, the sports psychology, what it's like to be out there for, <laughs> for as many hours you are, again, you just don't have that with anything else and, and you have to be able to train for that. Um, included with that sort of the mental toughness of just how to get through these, these ultra run, you know, you can kind of, you can suffer like a dog through a marathon, you know, even if it really sucks, but that's not necessarily the case with, with ultra run. You have to be much more strategic, obviously. So I would say those were sort of the biggest ones for me that I was really, can I, it was funny because I came into this almost as, as a student as well. You know, I was learning from you as I was developing this, as we were co-developing this. And, and those were the ones I was just most blown away with. Again, even though I, by that point, I had an understanding that, okay, this isn't just training for a long, a long marathon or training for a marathon. I was just blown away by the differences. Well, and I, I split it into, into thirds, like one third was the same and then two thirds was different. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. skeletal system is a skeletal system. The muscular system is a muscular system. Energy systems are energy systems. The benchmarks, there's like slightly nuances and things like that. But then everything after that, which that's about a third of the yeah. content right there, the other two thirds are all kind of entirely different, which yeah. is once again, I, I, think, I think that that illustrates that if you know the fundamentals, you can parlay those into different and different sports. You need to do some homework on, this is kind of my coaching background. I came into coaching as a runner, but I initially started working with cyclists and triathletes, but because I had strong fundamentals and knew how I knew anatomy and physiology, I knew physiology well, I knew biomechanics very well, I knew energy systems very well and things like that. I could parlay that into coaching a cyclist, coaching a triathlon, and then learn the nuances of, of, of triathlon and cycling. Not that it was easy, but I started with the fundamentals and I kind of, and, and I was able to, to take that, to take that approach, but I've always viewed it as one third, two thirds in yeah. terms of how you've organized things. One third is common. And then the other two thirds is completely unique to that, to that, uh, to that sport discipline. Yeah. And I would say another thing that was shocking to me as well is the resistance training. You know, our, our standpoint is that, you know, for running resistance training is very important, you know, heavy resistance training, explosive training to increase the spring systems, you know, get that pop when you're running. Um, and that's a hundred percent correct, but that's absolutely not a hundred percent correct in regard to ultra running, you know, as far as so, so that, you know, and again, it's sort of that, not that it would hinder you per se, but it's that sort of balance you're already putting in this much time from an energy standpoint, is that extra resistance training really 
a benefit or is it a potential liability? So, so yeah, I would agree with you. I think so many things that, you know, within the quote unquote normal distances of running, you know, the road racing, um, that a hundred percent of the right way to go more than likely probably is not the case with ultra running. And I, and I think it's, it's a profound difference. It's a different proposition. Yeah. Did you get a lot of pushback on that, by the way? You and I haven't yeah. talked about this. I got a decent amount. Um, I, I think, you know, to be 100% transparent, I think having your name attached to it, like I'm sure if I just said it, like, oh, God, that's total BS. Like, oh, wait, I said that? That's okay. That's, I'll, I'll buy that. But no, we did get some pushback. We got a little people like, this This just isn't the right, you know? And I'm like, well, look, you know, and I would say, you know, my response always, well, look, it is a different value proposition, what we're talking yeah. about here. Um, you know, you, people, coaches can certainly do whatever they feel like. Um, but we're like, look, this is, this is essentially what, what the science says, what, you know, we wanted to go to the best people, you know, I never wanted to be the, the smartest person in the room. I was always trying to find the, you know, the smartest people, which when it came to ultra running, which is why I went to you. And I'm like, look, this is, this is what Coop says. This is what the science says. Here it is, you know, do with it as you please. But, um, but yeah, we did get a little pushback. It was kind of funny. It's it's always the most content that and the diet side is always the most contentious piece. I, I've told a story a couple of times. I'll totally get on this podcast because you'll appreciate it. So in, in the first edition of the book, I made a really egregious error. I had this whole strength training piece laid out. It was probably 7,000 words or 10,000 words or something like that. Normal whole chapter's length. And my publisher came back and they said, listen, you've got to reduce the length of the book because the price is going to be this. And, you know, there's this many pages and blah, 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 blah. And you've got to cut some thing. You've got to cut some things. And so I reduced that chapter to like a 500 word sidebar or something like that. It still had the same conclusions. You know, it was just, I just kind of, I really, I really trivialized it. But going from, from, you know, what was eight or 9,000 words down to 500 words, you obviously lose kind of the entire background of it. And I got hammered for that. I just, I got absolutely creamed and, you know, I, everybody went up in arms and I just kind of, I just kind of rolled my eyes. So the next edition of the book, I have a whole, like, it's even bigger than, than I originally intended it to be. But uh, yeah, it, but same, but it's the same answer. Right. I mean, it kind of comes down to the same conclusion that it's a different strength training in particular is a different value proposition in ultra running as compared to road running and track running. Yeah. But if you just explain it with more words, maybe, I don't know. Right. We'll see if people get just as pissed off. <laughs> yeah. And I, say, I think a lot of people, you know, when they, when they look at it, uh, you know, is something good or bad or right or wrong? It always comes from their, just their own personal perspective. Not I've coached all these people and, you know, this is what it is, you know, so a lot of blowback I've gotten over the years of coaching as well. Um, and, and, and even with these certifications is, well, you know, Rick, you said this isn't right or whatever, but I've done it and it works for me, you know, and yeah. that's great. I'm glad for you. You, sh you should keep doing that. But we're, what we're saying is, as a whole, you know, there might not be a lot of substance to it, but if it works for you personally, keep doing it, but you can't extrapolate that to it works for everybody. And that's the other problem I think with coaching as a whole, um, which we kind of hit on before is I think a lot of, um, you know, I don't want to use the word unprofessional, but maybe unknowledgeable coaches just take their own personal coaching experience. You know, I did this X, Y, Z to be able to run a five minute mile. Therefore that will work for everybody. And that's one of the main things our certifications also focus on is look, everybody's body responds differently to the same training stimuli. So I think that's another th important thing for just coaches as a whole to, to remember. It's not just what works for you. It's, it's, you know, understanding how the body works and then, you know, figuring out on an indiv individual basis. Yeah. So it, 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 that kind of, there's another flavor of that and that not only ha this works for me, so I'm going to do it for this person, it, but it's just as egregious when somebody says, this is what I've done. And in the, it's usually the elite athlete. This is what I've done for X, Y, Z elite athlete. So it's also going to work for you. Right, right. Same thing. Like, it's like the exact same thing. I see that in articles a lot. Like here's so-and-so's you know, now that Mo Molly Seidel's a household name, I'm sure that, you know, her workouts are going to get posterized everywhere and everybody's going to do whatever version of it. It's And it's just as egregious, right? It's just because just sure. it worked for her doesn't mean that it's going to work for everybody else out there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so let's take a trip down memory lane. <laughs> you approached me about writing this ultra running certification. And my first initial reaction was one of skepticism. I sure. thought that I didn't think that there was a market for it, to be honest with you. Like I know the market really well, you know, I'm a professional, I was a professional endurance coach and then I was a professional running coach and I'm, I would call myself now a professional ultramarathon coach. I never would have thought that that, that transition would actually have happened because the market in ultra running is just so small. 
So you approached me like, hey, you know, I want to do a specific ultra marathon coaching certification, which is the the quintessential definition of a niche of a niche, right? Ultra running is a niche and then the coaching within ultra running is a niche of that niche, to which I said to you, I was like, you're going to sell like 10 of these, dude. Like, I'm all like, like whatever, we could do the content or whatever. But like, I, I had zero, I had zero expectations. Needless to say, not to toot our own horns or whatever, but it's been successful, like way more successful than I would have ever thought. You said the same thing, uh, same thing to me uh, privately. What What is driving that? Like, I don't know. And I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, it's my name or whatever. But I never would have guessed that there would be this many people that are interested in ultra marathon coaching specifically. That's what that's what is kind of getting me. It is very, very specific. That is ultra running. Yeah. What do you think is driving that? Is it coaches that want the knowledge? Is it athletes that want the knowledge? Is it is it people from other sports that are having their athletes do ultra running that they need some education in it? Like, what does that mix actually look like? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I think it's a little bit. I think it's all the above. I, I think to answer your question, um, you know, we I would say maybe ten percent of the people that purchase it. Uh, the ultra running certification are doing it just for themselves. You know, they have no desire to to coach other people. They just want to learn how to how to run better themselves. They're athletes. They're athletes. Yeah. 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 Exactly. They just want to be able to perform better. Okay. Um, so I would say maybe another 10% are probably, you know, work I'm mostly a running coach or I'm mostly a cycling coach, but for whatever reason I have these two or three people that come to me and want me to coach them for this, you know, 50 mile or 100 miles and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. So I <laughs> I, I need to figure out what I'm doing. I appreciate those coaches the most because yeah. it'd be easy for them to just like, okay, we're just going to increase your volume by 25% or right. whatever, whatever reasonable percentage. But it's, I, I think it's a good sign, it right? Does. Going back to our professionalism, in the industry for them to raise their hand and say, you know what? I don't know what I'm doing. I'll help you out. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure it out. I yeah. think that's cool. Yeah. They definitely understand sort of scope of knowledge. I think that, 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 that percentage, but I would say the rest are, are pretty hardcore ultra runners, you know, and I guess hardcore mean, you know, they've done some, they plan to do a lot more. That's, that's their thing. And I think, you know, all of us want to feel, you know, special. I don't know. I don't know what the right word is, but, you know, I, I would see that in cycling a lot, you know, where, you know, it's not just, you know, I'm a, I'm a rider, I'm a cyclist, you know, I'm, I wear the skin, yeah, yeah, I yeah. shave my legs, I you know, do all these things. So I think, you know, a lot of ultra runners, you know, they just don't feel that incorrectly so that, you know, the running certification really applied to them. They felt like, look, again, it's, it's better than nothing. And I learned a lot and, and, and I'm sure it's great, but that's not my demographic. I want to train ultra runners. And I think quite frankly, they probably had a better understanding than I did as far as, and maybe even than you did as far as like, um, you know, how much of a need there was for this certification. I think that they said, you know, look, this is enough different and quite enough different that I feel that, you know, um, this is something that needs to be out there and I want to take it. And I would say the real catalyst for it, we got all these, in our in our coaches group that you just spoke of, the Facebook coaches group, I, mean, I got bombarded with notes all the time. Hey, Rick, when are you going to do ultra running? When are you going to do ultra running? I'm an ultra runner. I'm an ultra runner. When you know, so it was clear to me, at least within our segment, within our little USCO world, that there was a, certainly a need for it. And I, I took the gamble that, okay, if this, if this is representative of the population as a whole, I think there's something to it. We see that play out in the ultra marathon world a lot. You know, in the, in the next few weeks, when this podcast come out comes out, it might be two weeks from, from when this podcast comes out. The Leadville Trail 100 is going to happen. Mm. And I always use that as a little bit of a barometer for growth because it attracts a lot of new people into the sport because it doesn't have an entry requirement. It has gotten a lot of media attention from different angles, right, over the years. Mm. And you see people, and it has a big field. And so you see people in that race that you don't normally see at other ultras, which I lovingly describe as the same group of idiots that just goes to different locations. <laughs> Leadville is a little bit different. They have like, you know, they've, they've got the core group of idiots that's at, that's at Leadville, but then they have all these other people that are trying to like get into the village, you know, so to speak, right. the idiot village. Um, but the, your, so my point with that is, is your anecdote of your current coaching group. And just for everybody's kind of clarification, those are the people that have taken one of the USCA certifications saying, when are you going to do ultra running? I think is a reflection of the client base that they're looking or that they're working with saying, I'm going to do something like Leadville because it popped up on the radar, or I'm going to do my local 50 K or something like that. They're going to like 
parlay their endurance experience in running and triathlon and cycling or in running and triathlon, I guess would be uh, more appropriate and, and try to get into this ultra marathon more and the coaches reacting to that saying, okay, I need to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think, you know, is, and it, maybe you could answer this question better than I, but I think everyone is always looking for a new challenge. Um, mm -hmm. And what I found is instead of going down in distance and saying, going up in speed, like, okay, I'm at, you know, running a half marathon, but I want to try to nail this 5k uh, PR, everything goes up in distance, you know, <laughs> 5K, 10k, half marathon, marathon. Well, what now I've already peaked out. I've already done five marathons. Well, ultra marathon is, is what I got to do then, you know, and you see that with, you see that with triathlon too, you know, going up to the, from the sprint distance all the way up to, uh, to the Ironman distance. So, um, I think it's sort of a natural evolution of things as far as maybe how people's brains work. And, and, you know, you and I spoke of this certainly with COVID, um, when, you know, the big mass start races weren't happening, um, you know, the ultra, the ultras were the first one to come back online because it makes the most sense because you're naturally socially distanced. It's easier to, you know, do that, do that kind of thing. And, and I think it's just easier training wise too. You know, you're out there in the woods or you're just out there training, you know, it's not quite the same as, you know, showing up at your local track or something and doing speed work. So, so I think there's a lot of things that sort of maybe, uh, led to that, you know, that big push with ultra running. I'm sure there's a million more reasons, but those are the ones that are probably the most um, pertinent in my mind. Huh, it's so interesting. Yeah, I, I seeing the whole industry kind of play out after COVID has been really interesting, because you're right, the ultra marathon world has kind of come back a lot more quickly than the marathon world, and even the cycling in the in the triathlon world. Yeah. But I think a lot that also forced people, as you said, back into like into that sport, right, where we're seeing a lot of like new people come like just come in, come into ultra running which is almost exactly as i as i predicted right so we've just gone through this like really pivotal i, I think this covid moment that we're just kind of I, I keep saying we're seeing the tail of it but i know there's another shoe to drop right like everybody's like bracing right now for something yeah. else like material to happen and the world implodes again but let's assume that just doesn't happen what like what's next right i mean you're you're an op entrepreneur i really appreciate like what you've done you've kind of created something out of nothing and you know this space really well what's next and i want you to like position it almost from the athlete's point of view because it's that's that's mainly the listeners right there's a lot of coaches that listen to this but it's going to be predominantly athletes What's going to be next for the athletes to try to navigate with this whole like coach athlete relationship and just trying to like find a coach and stuff like that? What's on, what's on the horizon? What do you want to create that currently isn't out there right now? Um, you know, it, it, again, it's another great question. I think because that whole coach um, relationship is sometimes hard to even get, one of the things that we're going to be doing is creating sort of a coach match program, if you will, you know, where we'll have, we already have a database of coaches, um, but to help facilitate a little bit better, um, where, you know, what we want to be is sort of that hub or sort of the conduit for people that are looking for coaches. You know, they know that all of our coaches have gone through at least our certifications. Um, so they know at least they have that base foundation of knowledge. And then from there, they can go through and find out about a coach's you know, about their training philosophy or coaching philosophy, you know, what sports specifically do they focus in? What disciplines is it? 5k marathon, ultra running. Um, and, uh, and to just keep building that database, start help or start marketing that database. So it serves, you know, that, that athlete as best as possible to kind of decrease the, the barrier, you know, decrease the hurdles to finding a good coach. Cause at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. You know, we want to create the best coaches possible, but that's only makes sense if people can, can then link up with those coaches. Please make that happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, I, I'm begging you because I've seen people try to like crack that nut. I had a colleague of mine that, that went on his own little side business and tried to crack it, that nut and it was really hard for him. And he decided it was too hard. Yeah. Training peaks has tried to crack that nut, which I think that you, you know, you're aware of they've had, yeah. you know, various coach matching services and it's, that's a hard thing for them. Yeah. And they have a, they have a big database of coaches, but if we go back to my, one of my original points, good coaching is good for coaching. If we can have more good coach athlete experiences, that's good for the whole, that's good for the athletes, obviously. It's also good for the, the, the coaching industry. Getting the coach athlete match right yeah. is the linchpin in that proposition. It is the linchpin in that proposition. And if there is something or somebody figures out a way to be that conduit so that athletes don't have to guess which is what they're currently doing. Let's get that. Let's get that straight. They're currently kind of guessing and they're guessing based off of 
you know, their friend's opinion, they read so-and-so articles, they saw this awesome athlete, so that kind of resonated with me or whatever. But those are all guesses at the end of the day. If there's some conduit that would like pair people up, just like in the airline industry, you want to find a flight, you go to kayak or you know, what was formerly orbits or what do people use now? I still use kayak. <laughs> um, but if there's something like that to like harness both sides of the information, yeah. who are you and what you're looking for and match it up, that that would solve so many of those that would create way more good experiences than bad experiences. Way yeah, more. exactly. And, and I think is, you know, is both you and I both is both an athlete and a coach. Um, you know, that's, that's really where the rubber hits the road. And that's, that's the thing that we want the most at USCA is to, to see coaches and athletes thriving. And that's to your point, that's really only, only going to happen with a really well-connected cover. Not that you need a system, but you know, we, cause when you see that happen, you know, between a coach and an athlete that are just syncing perfectly. I mean, it's, it's magic. It really is. And, uh, and, and the more of that we can get the better. And that's what it's all about. I think it's worth 10 to 20% yeah. improvement. Like yeah. if I, people, I, people ask you like, what's the value proposition? It's 10 to 20%. Yeah. If you get yeah. it right with the right athlete and the right coach, 10 to 20% better than the athlete having a bad coach or the athlete trying to do it themselves. Yeah. I completely agree. I completely I, agree. Yeah. yeah. Somewhere in that range. I'm a math guy. So I always try to quantify things like that. <laughs> All right, Rick, that's a brilliant place to leave it, man. Um, I'm going to include show notes uh, uh, on USCA and where they can find the ultra running specific certification. But where else can they find you? I know that you guys are trying to like increase your social media presence and there's a Facebook group and things like that. Where if they want more information, Rick, where, where, they, where can they go to find out stuff about USCA? Yeah, again, to your point, we're going to be developing more social. Right now, we're primarily on Facebook. So if you just go to United Endurance Sports Coaching Academy, um, that's probably the best place right now. Um, and then our website, coachendurancesports.com. But yeah, we're going to be um, having a little more uh, Instagram presence right now. We have a site. I think we have two posts up. <laughs> so we got to <laughs> do a little work there. That's, that's it's pretty sad. So yeah, we got to get going on that. <laughs> I find it ironic that you fall into the same trap that most really good coaches do is their social media presence sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I was all excited to put it up and I put up two posts. I'm like, all right, I won. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you just hire a, hire a Gen Z or a millennial to do that stuff, right? Come uh, on, man. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I can even spell Instagram. Maybe that's part of the problem. <laughs> there you go. All right, we'll work on that. Hey, but I, for me to you, man, I really appreciate what you brought to the table here. It makes coaching better, which I, I appreciate the most. I appreciate the opportunity to work with you and create this content. As I, as I mentioned to you before, it the ultra running certification but also all the other ones are things that i would encourage any coach to take and i don't say that a lot like usually the stuff i'm sending coaches to are really 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 specific but these certifications are really well done you did a great job curating them it's got the right breadth and depth of knowledge to all of them and uh, like I said, I'm just really appreciative of that because it elevates the the field as a whole. And that's an awesome thing that you can hang your hat on. Well, well I appreciate it. Thank you so much. And again, it's, it's, it's been great partnering with you. And again, thank you so much for having me on the, the Coopcast. This is, it's been great chatting with you. All right. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Coop. All right, Trail and Ultra Runners, there you have it. There you go. Much thanks to everybody for joining in on the podcast today. I'm really thankful that my voice made it all the way through. I've just got this outro to cut before I can give it a little bit of a rest. Thanks for Rick for coming on the podcast today. I really appreciate his entrepreneurial spirit as well as what USCA does in terms of raising the bar for coaching as a whole. I really think that that is good for coaches and that's good for athletes. And for all the athletes out there that either have a coach or are, think about, or are thinking about uh, becoming a coached athlete, I encourage all of you to undertake some of the things that Rick and I talked about during the podcast and namely ask your coach or your prospective coach what they do to make themselves better professionally as a coach. I think that singular question will go a long, long way. In the show notes, I'll have a conversation to our athlete services manager, Dominic Gunto, where we go over a lot of these topics as well. And as an extra special prize, is it a prize? extra special something or other for all the listeners out there if you're interested in the ultra marathon coaching certification from usco which i obviously think is fantastic but that's a completely biased point of view it is really good people 
you can get $100 off of that coaching certification by using the promo code COOPCAST100, all in lower case. If you just go to the USCA website, that's U-E-S-C-A, or you go to www.coachendurancesports.com, you can take advantage of that promo code and see what that excellent content is all about. It's for athletes and for coaches alike. Appreciate the heck out of each and every one of the listeners, you guys. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.